The Afterwards podcast is taking a holiday break, so we are showcasing another book TV program. Time Magazine listed author Stacey Schiff's The Revolutionary Samuel Adams as one of the 10 best nonfiction books of 2022. In this podcast, she details the life, accomplishments, and events that led to his recognition as the father of the American Revolution. Afterwards, we'll return with new episodes on Saturday, January 7th. Stacy Schiff has written books about Benjamin Franklin, Cleopatra, and the Witches of Salem. And now it's Samuel Adams, a Massachusetts man Thomas Jefferson called the father of the American Revolution. Stacy Madeline Schiff was appropriately born in Adams, Massachusetts, graduated from Phillips Academy and Williams College. Samuel Adams was born in Boston and lived for 81 years from 1722 to 1803. He's also been called the most Puritan and the most populist of the American founders. If you met him before his 41st birthday, according to author Schiff, you probably wouldn't consider him much of a success. Stacy Schiff, when you were thinking about your next book, how did it all work? Where were you? When did you decide? How did you sell the idea? Um... It's a, it's a, it's somewhat woolly in my memory, but here's here's my best analysis of it. I was um, coming out of five years in Salem, Massachusetts, having written about the witch trials in 1692, and I think I was very much looking for someone who stood in the light after those very dark years, someone who stood, um, someone who took a very noble stand. I think I was thinking a lot about the people who first raised their hands um, and suggest that perhaps the Salem witch trials have proved some kind of miscarriage of justice, which was a very risky assertion to make at the time. So I was looking for someone who had that kind of moral fiber. Um, It was 2016. I think we were all thinking um, a great deal about democracy. And I had gone back to, for other reasons, to my Ben Franklin book. I'd done a book about Ben Franklin's years in France, in which Samuel Adams makes a cameo. And I was, I think, somewhat appalled by my own ignorance of Samuel Adams um, the more I read among his contemporaries, the more clear it was that to them, he was the founder's founder. He was, as Jefferson puts it, the most active, the earliest, the most persevering of the patriots. John Adams, Samuel's cousin, will say that the true char- the, the real story of the revolution could not be written without the character of Samuel Adams. So I, I was sort of fumbling around thinking, how, why is he so preeminent to his contemporaries and, and so lost to us? So how does it how does it work? How do you start making a proposal and how much research did you do before you went forward with it? I I thought I was researching a book on someone else, um, to be perfectly um, clear. And I went to, to my local library where I tend to do the early research for every book. And there's a biography floor, which is obviously shelved alphabetically. And the woman whom I thought I was writing about papers were to the right and Samuel Adams's papers were to the left. And over time, I realized that I was winding up by mid-afternoon sitting on the floor underneath the Adams papers to the left, as opposed to pulling the books off the shelf to the right where I meant to be researching. Um, And at a certain point, I described the situation to my agent, who is usually fairly opinionated about subjects. And he said, "I I don't understand. Of course, you're meant to be writing a book about Samuel Adams. Sort of why are you hesitating here? And immediately grasped, um, or immediately felt that it was a that it was a fabulous idea. I was still, I think, a little uncertain because I was um, uncertain as to how much documentation I would have at my disposal. So, what did you do next? Um, then I did a very short proposal, which reassured me that a I thought he would make for excellent company. I mean, you know, you set off on these projects and you realize you're going to be in very close quarters with someone for five or six years. So you don't want to, um, you don't want to sign on lightly. I should say this person, you don't necessarily have to love this person, but you do have to somehow cohabitate with him or her for five, for five or six years or longer. Um, So I did a short proposal as much to convince my publisher as myself. Um, And I think in the end we were all convinced. So, so this is the same publisher. This is little Brown who also brought out um, Cleopatra and the witches. So once you've made the proposal and they like it at the publisher, how much time is there between that and when you 
really start serious research? And where did you go in the interim? How, how many places did you go to find out about Samuel Adams? I think I, I, I don't really wait to hear from the publisher if I think we're off and running. Um, I think I felt my agent's confidence was strong enough that I was going to be writing this book for someone. And I was thrilled to um, to land again at Little Brown. So I started right in with the papers of Samuel Adams, um, which for once in my life is actually in New York City where I live. I think this is the first time that's ever happened, that I live in the town where, my, where the primary documents are housed. Um, and that was a marvelous thing. The papers of Adams are published, but what is published is only his side of the correspondence and not in its entirety, I should add. Whereas the collection um, in the New York Public Library is both sides of the correspondence. So it allows you to flesh out a great deal. It allows you to see to what he's reacting, obviously, in his letters. You get a much more personal take. His letters from his wife, for example, are in that collection, although they are not in the published edition. Um, you get to see you know, hints and, and stabs from various friends and enemies which are in the collection. And I started there um, with those papers because that's really kind of ground zero. And then moved out, which is which is what I've done in the past, to more ancillary collections. So that meant material um, largely at the Massachusetts Historical Society and other Boston repositories, material that was in the Library of Congress, and then in a much sort of richer fashion, material that's in either the National Archives in London or the Parliamentary Archives in London, because those are the great um, repositories of letters written about Adams by the governors and lieutenant governors and the crown officials who be so annoyed for those 15 years leading up to the revolution. So that's a very, that's a, a, a particularly um, nuanced and colorful vision of Adams that we get from those papers. And of course, there are always heartbreaks along the way. There are always the, the things that you expect from which you expected to work that never turn up. And one of those in the, in the archive here at the New York Public Library, I had expected to find something about which I had read, which was a 50-page memoir of Adams by his daughter, um, which seems to have gone missing over the years. And I had hoped to work from that to get really a sense of the man at home, of the domestic Adams. And that's something which I've never located. Go back just for a second to the New York Society Library. The last person to mention that place <clears throat> to me in a, one of these chats was David Halberstam, who loved that place, and he'd talk about going there to do his research and help write his book. And then I saw you on a YouTube video uh, promoting the New York Society Library, looking for, I assume, contributions. Talk about that place and why that matters so much, and what's the benefit of using that particular library? Well, my problem as a non-academic is that I don't have immediate access to a university library. Now, that has changed now that Columbia and NYU and, New York, and the New York Public Library are part of a consortium. But for years, the New York Society Library was the sole library where I had access to the stacks. And I can't stress enough, and I'm sure every other writer of nonfiction would say the same, the importance and the just general value of an open stack library. Because inevitably, you go into the library for the book you think you need, and you discover that the book you really need is the next one on the shelf which you would never have discovered had you not been doing, had you not made that trip yourself. And, you know, very often the research for these books is a matter of just gnawing your way through a particular shelf or set of shelves of literature. And to be able to sort of see what's there, um, just to quantify it and to sort of orient yourself um, is just of unfathomably, unfathomable importance. The New York Society Library um, is also interesting in that, for me, in that it has a very... Um, it has a very sophisticated and, I guess, opinionated readership. Whenever you find sort of someone who, whenever you pull a book off the shelf in which someone has written in the margins, they generally do seem to have known more than the author herself knew. So sometimes that marginalia is actually really helpful. Um, but it's just, a, it's an amazing place to work in for, for New York City, an amazing resource. How did the Samuel Adams papers get to the New York Society Library? The New York, um, the Samuel Adams papers are in the New York Public Library. Oh, I'm sorry. And I, I yeah. and I believe, and I believe they are there because they were part of the Bancroft gift, that massive collection of American history. I'm fairly certain he had acquired them and that they made their way to that library with his, um, with his gift.
So when you're looking at the papers, how how big are they and how much of those do you read? I think biographers like to like anyone, biographers like to brag, and they, I think we brag in linear linear feet. You know, my subject, I had to read my way through, you know, 20 miles of linear feet to get to the, the heart of the matter. There isn't, unfortunately, that much for Adams. There are, there are shelves, but they are not massive shelves. Um, they are, there are other things that are there that are equally central to his life. For example, the Boston Committee of Correspondence papers are there, which we can talk about, and are, are, are an immense... Um, are immensely helpful in filling out around the edges. Um, sorry, I just I totally lost my train of thought. We were talking about the, <laughs> the New York Public Library, the stacks. Um, yeah, no, I was um, going to say something about... <laughs> oh, I know, sorry, I was going to say. Um, but what I normally do is to start with those, with that primary source and those primary documents and read them once through without necessarily the context um, which would entirely explain them to me. And then I, I sort of branch out a little bit and I go to the ancillary collections and I read the secondary materials and I begin to fill in the cast of characters. And in this case, the colonial positions and the British posturing and all of the other, all of the rest of the picture. And then ultimately I go back to those original documents when of course they read very differently. And when things tend to jump off the page in a way they hadn't hadn't done earlier. For example, there was a there's just a, there's one letter from an individual who appears nowhere else in the Adams papers who mentions to Samuel Adams when he's in Philadelphia at one point that he had stopped at Adams's home and essentially emptied all of the papers from the home so that they couldn't fall into the hands of the British soldiers in town who would have loved to prey upon them. And it's just it's such an act of um, dedication, such an act of devotion to Adams. Um, we don't know who this individual was. It's the only letter from him, but it's really telling. And and that's the kind of thing that doesn't necessarily jump out at you until you really know the shape of the story. And this was true as much with Salem Witchcraft, where I, I read the documents and then I spent two or three years reading around them and then ultimately went back to them a second time. Did you have, did you go to those other places you mentioned, the Massachusetts historical society library of congress down here or is everything now online i a lot of things are online i went everywhere um i just feel i need to read the documents themselves i i think most i don't think i'm unusual in this the feeling that that you want to sort of touch the paper that your subject touched you want to see the primary document you want to be able to read through what's so assiduously crossed out um there's some kind of magic at to me anyway, and actually seeing and handling the original documents wherever it's possible. So yes, and the, and the, and the, the truly, um, I think, greatest cache of those is probably the public records office in, in Kew and in, in the UK, where you have copy after copy of beleaguered customs official or um, royal governor um, writing back to London saying, I just don't know what to do about these obstreperous colonists. And these letters are often written in you know, quadruplicate, so they turn up in different files. But there's a massive amount of just crumbling, incredibly rich and colorful material there. A non sequitur question. Back in those days, in 1750s, 60s, 70s, did the Americans who were British citizens have an accent like the British? It's one of the great unanswered questions. Everyone obviously is British. Um, there are very, there are relatively few mentions of which I'm aware where people comment on other people's accents. We know a couple of things which I think speak to the question. We know that British officers who are sent into the countryside um, to spy on what American, what, what the what the Americans might be cooking up with those munitions in Concord, those kind of British spies when they open their mouths, nobody knows that they're British officers. So presumably they speak, everyone speaks more or less the same English. Um, on the other hand, and we also know that there are British, there, there are deserters from the British army who live undercover, so to speak, um, because the Americans have welcomed them very warmly and have helped them to, um, who has suborned them and helped them to leave Boston. They sort of just fit in easily in the countryside. On the other hand, we do know that there is a distinct New England accent. 
and we have we have fairly good descriptions of that and also from the very eccentric spelling um you get a fairly good sense of it it it, it isn't completely distant from the boston accent today and there's actually a, a a wonderful mention in of ben franklin's when john adams arrives in france to assist with the french alliance um franklin met, talks about how how it's sort of music to his ears to hear the new england accent again so obviously john adams is speaking a somewhat different english than were franklin's other american associates you mentioned benjamin franklin you did a book on that what did you think of him after you spent so much time with him uh, you know i'll admit that part of um the reason i was rooting around in that book and thinking about samuel adams was that i was looking for something of an excuse to spend more time with ben franklin which i would add this book did not provide um franklin is just effortlessly good company and i think endlessly fascinating because there are so many sides to him so my sense of franklin i would i would happily write another book i'd happily go back to spend five or six more years with benjamin franklin i'm not sure i would feel that way about cleopatra or any other number of people i've written about franklin well, we is fascinating because whatever you say about him you can almost say the opposite and argue both sides. I mean, he's just, he's so multidimensional um, and so sort of sinuous a character that I, I just find him endlessly entertaining. About this time in a podcast like this, somebody's saying as they're listening, why aren't they talking more about Samuel Adams? And I would just point out that you and I chatted a couple weeks ago. We had some technical problems, but we're able to save a lot of our conversation and that is available to anyone listening to this at the end of this discussion uh, back to samuel adams did you see his actual handwriting yes all of those um all of those documents are in his hand and I'm, and i think that's the other piece of you know wanting to see the actual papers you 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 know you want to sort of see the pen as it's scratching its way across the page we have a number of accounts of him writing through the night writing tirelessly for american rights so we know that he's a um like franklin for that matter a very an easy writer he's very much at his ease on the page less at his ease as a speaker but very much at his ease on the page and he's an excellent letter writer in fact um so so yes i spent as much time as i could um with those documents at the top of each of your 13 chapters, you have a quote from somebody. Um, and I thought to take some time to ask you about some of these quotes and who the people are and why you chose them. I'll start by um, with the second chapter. And the, the title of the chapter is A Voice in the Darkness, A Knock at the Door. And then the quote is from Thomas Hutchison, 1779. Quote, everything in American affairs happens contrary to probability, unquote. Well, I will admit, first off, that what you just called the second chapter, um, and which indeed appears in the book as the second chapter, was to my mind the first chapter. And that the what is now the first chapter was to me an introduction. However, my publisher is of the mind that no one reads introductions, and so he renumbered the chapters. So I thought of that as the first chapter, and I thought of Thomas Hutchinson's as sort of the opening salvo in the sense that, I mean, I wanted the book to begin with this idea that what is about to happen is just wildly improbable. And I mean, that is so much the trick, obviously, in writing history is reinserting into it the precariousness and the accidental nature and the fragility of it all. But the fact that Thomas Hutchinson can't become something of the antihero of this book, he's lieutenant governor and ultimately governor of Massachusetts can't grasp the currents that are roiling um, the colony around him is so much at the heart of what's about to happen. And the fact that this could all have happened so swiftly and so unexpectedly to have gone from, you know, spotlessly loyal to, as Thomas Hutchinson will see it, you know, stark raving mad over the course of a decade, um, really sort of, it's, it's mind-bendingly complicated so i wanted I, I i didn't want to lose sight of hutchinson i'm very fond of thomas hutchinson despite how much um of a nuisance adams was to him and i wanted him to have the opening shot what was the difference in their age hutchinson i think is 13 years older i think hutchinson is born in 1711 maybe it's less than that they're, they're about a decade apart 
they're very similar in their backgrounds, um, which also I find very interesting. They're both sort of fifth generation sons of Massachusetts. Hutchinson's family has distinguished itself over the years in public service. They both go to the same schools. They both end up with master's degrees from Harvard. Hutchinson at 26 will enter the House of Representatives. He marries very well to another sort of family dynasty. Um, he prospers financially as Adams does not. And he becomes by the 1760s as Adams is kind of ambling his way toward some kind of significance. He becomes sort of the face of authority and the face of prosperity, I should say, and the face of authority in Boston because he has begun already to accumulate a, a great number of, of titles. And so he is kind of the anti-Adams in many ways, but he's an immensely, he's as devoted to Massachusetts as is Adams, and he's an immensely dutiful and diligent and modest and sober and appealing man. By the way, I pointed out in the introduction that you were born in Adams, Massachusetts, and you went to Williams College, which means that you spent a lot of time around Massachusetts. Did that have anything to do with your interest in Adams? And um, why do you live in New York City? Um, I think there is probably some um, obsession with the New England starchiness. I, I think I, you know, I'm completely educated in New England. Um, the Adams twist there's a wonderful, wonderful writer of writing. I'm sure you know his work named Bill Zinser, who tried to convince me about a decade ago that I needed to write a memoir. And I think the biographer just rears at the very idea of memoir because part of the joy of writing biography, of course, is escaping one's own life. But there was something almost, um, there was something appealing about going home in a way with Adams, Massachusetts. I was, again, mortified that I was so ignorant of Adams because I come from Adams, Massachusetts. Um, it seemed like it was. It seemed like it was just a, a, a delightful. It was. It was kismet in a way to be working on Samuel Adams and to know that I had not known of him all these years. It seemed somehow preordained. Um, I think that this book, to some extent, this book, the Franklin book and the witches, somehow felt to me like they fell together on a continuum, a sort of New England continuum, and I sort of felt as if this was the book that took us from those Puritan years um, of Salem to the Enlightenment years of Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. I've heard you make the comment before about avoiding one's own life, but as an outsider, I don't know that much about you, but we've talked before, I see a, a person that's had, a, what, over a 30-year marriage, had three children, a lot of successful books, why are you afraid of writing about your own life? How many more How many more minutes do we have? This could be a very interesting <laughs> session, Mr. Lamb. It's fine with me. Um, you know, I, was, I, wrote a piece, I wrote a piece once, of which I'm actually quite fond about the difficulties of writing biography and how you, you think about, you think you've left yourself entirely out of the book because you've, and, and you've spent years, you know, you're emptying the dishwasher, but you're really back in 18th century Paris or whatever you've just you know you've somehow time traveled as opposed to paid attention to the life at hand and then you write the book and then you discover that somehow unwittingly you've landed pieces of yourself on every single page so I think I've escaped but I obviously don't entirely escape um and yes I plead guilty to a 30 some odd year marriage and to having indeed had three children how old are the kids they're not kids, the kids anymore. are they're not kids anymore 30 31 29 and 22. I, I, I did just inscribe this book to the 22 year old who asked for a copy as you know, your adoring and absent mother. And she called me and gave me a song and dance about why I had written and absent. So I think that was a good sign. And what did they do? Um, the 22 year old is a senior in, at, in university, a history major, just for the record. Um, the 28 year old does China um, strategy research in DC and the the 31 year old does real estate development in Denver. Over the years, when you've written these other books um, that have gotten you a lot of awards, how much interaction do you, do you have with these children of yours and how interested are they along the way? I, I think that um, for whatever reason, I've tried to keep my professional life separate from their lives. I just feel as if it this shouldn't be a burden to them in any way and where they've asked about it or wanted to read about it 
obviously I've been delighted. Um, but I just feel as if they should be allowed to make their own ways in the world and pick their own, um, pick their own read. They're all great. They're all huge readers. So I, it's been a delight to me when they've decided they wanted to read a great improvisation or Cleopatra, but I haven't wanted it to get in their way. So when they were growing up, did you create an atmosphere where they automatically started reading or were you the one that uh, made the suggestion? Um, I think they grew up noticing that if they were reading a book, they didn't have to do their chores. And that became an, an incredible enticement right there. Um, I will admit that there was probably cause and effect. What's that Robert Lawson book about the mouse in Ben Franklin's hat? Ben and me, I think it's called. Um, it's a charming children's book in which um, Franklin in France, wearing his incredible Martin fur hat, has also given lodging to a little mouse who lives in the hat and who is obviously the mastermind behind Franklin's dealings in France. And I may have read that book to the kids so many times that I then landed on the idea of writing a book about Franklin in France. So I may have benefited from the bedtime reading as much as they did. For a moment, let's go back to the process. So you've you've talked to your agent, you move ahead, starting your research. How long did you research? Well, let me ask first. When did the publisher say yes? How long did that take? And is there discussion about how much they're willing to pay you at that point? There's most absolutely a discussion about how much they're willing to pay me. And the great blessing um, is to have an agent so you don't have to be privy to that conversation particularly. Um, so that's really between agent and publisher. With most books, that's you know it can be a quick conversation. It can be a protracted conversation. But it's very often a conversation about what part of the world the publisher is buying rights in. For example, Cleopatra has been published in 35 foreign editions. This is a book, this is an American book. So really, there's only one market um, for this book. You could conceivably see a British edition. And actually, interestingly, the only foreign publisher so far to have licensed it is Chinese. Um, but this is really a book about America and to be sold in the North American market. So that, so that simplifies to some extent. Um, the deal, but I'm but I'm at that point already researching. I'm I'm leaving that piece of the I'm leaving the negotiation really to my agent who will check in. But it, it's a publisher with whom we've worked before with an existing relationship and a happy relationship. And I'm I'm so grateful to have a home where, where I feel that, that the books the books are sort of lodged to, together. Um, my first three books are with different publishers, so. Um, so that's sort of it was a it was a wonderful place to want to stay. And I'm delighted it worked out. Going back to the quotes at the beginning of a chapter, the, the next one was the great town of Boston. And it, this is a Samuel Johnson quote from 1775. Security and leisure are the parents of sedition. What's the point? Well, the interesting thing about. And I don't know why I find this endearing, but for Adams' first four decades, he amounts to very little. Um, he's very well educated. He comes from an affluent background. The family um, falls on hard times by the time he's graduated from Harvard. But he, he grows up with pretty much every advantage one could have in colonial Massachusetts and does almost nothing with that. And to some extent, he is benefiting, I guess I would argue, from the fact that he has He's able to engage politically as he does because he has had this extraordinarily good education and he has had the security um, of a fairly affluent home life. So I wanted to, to, to press the point that he's able to rock the boat as he does or have the time to rock the boat as he does precisely because he's had every advantage. Um, he isn't someone who's trying to scrape together a living. He, he will be ultimately, but he isn't born someone who's had to scrape together a living. It's a luxury to be able to think outside the box. It's a tremendous luxury to be able to sort of say, I think we can, I think we can design a more perfect system. Um, and he comes to those ideas, we know, during the years when he perhaps should have been pursuing a career, but instead he devotes himself to politics. And in fact, in his first in the first job he takes outside of the family, he's briefly sort of apprenticed to an accounting firm run by a, a very popular Bostonian, a close friend of his father's. Um, and ultimately, after not very many months, uh, the head of that firm will say, you know, he's a very capable young man, but all he can seem to think about is politics. 
And I think that's, you know, he could not have come to that um, position had he not had the grounding that he had. As you know, your quotes are from a lot of different people. Some of them, quite a few of them are British, but in Samuel Johnson's case, where do you find these quotes? How do how long did that take you to do that? They're, they're usually it's such a great question, Brian. They're usually things that either I've been carrying around in a notebook, and I guess this too should speak to your question about the research, which, by the way, takes you asked me and I didn't answer you. It usually takes me about three and a half years to research and then about a year and a half to write. And sometimes in the course of that writing, I will have to go back into the archive or back to the library to review something that I had earlier read or to fill in a blank where I didn't, or within the case of COVID, to go back to places that had been closed during during the pandemic. Um, I also keep a notebook, which is generally things where, you know, I'm reading Saul Bellow and suddenly there's a quote that pertains precisely to Salem witchcraft. Or I'm reading Samuel Johnson because that's the era of Samuel Johnson, and there are several lines that pertain precisely to what's happening in the colonies. And sometimes those quotes, which I think of as kind of the, I don't know, the the stem cells of the book, are just things that help me to be able to organize my thinking, to help some of the themes to begin to ferment. And sometimes they end up as chapter titles because they pull together a chapter in some way. And, and I think I that in many ways they are crutches for, for me to begin to see how what shape a chapter takes because the chapter isn't purely shaped chronologically. I like to think it's also shaped somewhat thematically. Do you, is there any way to to answer this question? Where did you learn to write? Did you have a somebody teaching you how to do it or did you just figure it out on your own? Like many writers, I had the mother who who marks up your fifth grade paper and so brutally so that you can barely see your own words. So I think I had a very good homegrown editor in the fact that I had it. My mother was an academic and she and she felt very strongly about the written word and about the proper use of the written word. Um, I read like I read like, you know, hungrily through my entire life. And I think that when you read like that, you end up it helps your writing to some to some extent, but you end up really just caring tremendously at a at a sentence by sentence level about the written word. Um, I remember the first time a, a, a teacher in high school returned a paper to me and said, um, "Have you ever considered being a writer?" and being sort of thrown back on my heels by that remark because it seemed it was something I'd really never considered. And in fact, this book, speaking of things that begin chapters, this book is dedicated to my eleventh grade history teacher who was my 11th grade U.S. history teacher who was one of those people. Name? Nancy Faust Sizer. Still with us? She is. I'm seeing her in a few weeks. Has she read all your books? You know, I've never, (laughs) I think you may have read more of them than she. I've never asked her that question, Brian, but after she hears this, she may have to. All right, fourth chapter. I don't, I don't. I don't know that she's read this one. As a matter of fact, <laughs> the fourth chapter is the very honest Samuel Adams, comma clerk, and the quote is from Marianne Evans, better known as George Eliot. The quote is: "The blessed work of helping the world forward happily does not wait to be done by perfect men." Why that quote? How long have you been holding out on that one? <laughs> Um, I think I was probably reading my way through. I read I read a lot of Eliot during COVID. I admit it. Um, I think there I really find his those first failed years so compelling, and I'm sure there's some psychological explanation for that why I find that so endearing. But you know, he's not someone who's marked for greatness, um, and yet he achieves beyond anyone's expectation. So the fact that you have this person who is so deeply flawed, who looks like he's going to amount to a perfect failure for so many years, who's just shambling his way around Boston, very much endearing himself to the townspeople. He's clearly very, very popular. He's often called into, you know, to adjudicate cases and to stand up for people in court and to help with people who want to draft documents. But he's, but he's not exactly a shining light for those early years. Um, And nor will he be a shining light at the end of his life. So I just I, I just wanted to sort of highlight, I suppose, his imperfections, because the improbability of the story on both levels, I mean, so improbable 
that a set of disunited colonies could have managed what they manage and so quickly and so improbable that someone of seemingly so little aptitude and so little application could prove to be this tremendously disciplined dynamo. I wanted to highlight both of those things right off. In fairness to our listeners, let's go through the quickly the background. Uh, he was born where? He's born in Boston, um, grows up in a wealthy family. He's born in 1722, so it's, it's, it's his, the 300th anniversary of his birth this year, which was another reason to finish the book on time, I might add. Um, and he grows up in a very affluent house um, overlooking Boston Harbor. His father was a maltster, not a brewer. Um, he will be sent to all the right schools, um, and he will go very briefly into the family business, as I said, have a somewhat checkered and, and undistinguished career after that. The family fortune is lost partly through his um, poor management and partly because of an act of parliament earlier in the early 1740s. And he will thereafter sort of have to try to find his footing, which is not an easy thing to do in Boston in those years. Boston's an, an economically um, downwardly. I, Boston is in a bit of an economic crisis in these years, so he's not the only one who's actually having trouble um, figuring out a way to support himself. How many kids does his parents have? They have 12, of which um, only a few survive. The, the, the mortality statistics for those years are really kind of astonishing. At least 12. How many times was he, was he married? He's married twice. He has two, two children um, survive from the first marriage. There is a hint of a miscarriage with the second wife, but the second wife does not seem to have, doesn't did not bear any children. So, the, so the two surviving children, the two children who will, whom we will meet in the book, are children from the first marriage. There's a lot about the different movements that he was involved in during those years in your book. But um, what off what political offices did he hold? So he essentially he he holds a few town offices early on. He's a market clerk. And he's a tax collector. But in the wake of the Stamp Act um, discussions, he will be elected to the House of Representatives. It's really that that crisis that puts him center stage. And he will be elected very quickly clerk of the House of Representatives. Now, let me just and ask is, you this. Was it the U.S. House or what house was it? No, no. Sorry, the Massachusetts House of okay. Representatives. Okay. This is all colony, colony level, exactly. Um, he will never hold federal office, in fact. Um and it's noted that very soon after he becomes clerk of the House, very soon after he enters the House, the House begins to speak in a much more brusque and much more peremptory tone than it had ever taken with a royal governor before. And that is very much the voice um, of Samuel Adams. I, um, did we talk about the gallery in the last time we talked? Oh, yes, One we of did. His, yeah. Okay, then I'm not going to go into that. Sorry. Um, how sick was he during his life? He's fairly robust, but he has from an early age a tremor. And it seems to have been a tremor that, not surprisingly, was exacerbated by stress that chiefly affected his hands and his neck. Um, and that seems in a few accounts almost to have given him a sort of mystical stature. I mean, there was something sort of otherworldly about his, um, about the shake, the, the quiver. It gets significantly worse after the revolution. And it, it, may, it may explain, by the way, why he's so much more comfortable on the page than in person, although we don't know that. Um, it will get significantly worse in the 1780s when he will very quickly go from saying I can only write a few paragraphs at a time because of the palsy in my hand to I can't write more than a line or two to someone else actually having to write for him. And because of that, we have a lot less of him from those years because the while the inclination to write may have been there, the ability to, to write had abandoned him. How tall was he? He seems to be of about middling stature, um, very muscular, barrel chested. Um, if you think about that amazing John Singleton Copley portrait of him that seems to have been the stance he took, kind of ramrod, ramrod straight in his bearing. Um, John Adams leaves a very, um, a very eloquent description of Samuel Adams when he, when he rose to spoke, just rose to speak. He, he sort of pulled himself up to his full height and almost bounced on his toes for emphasis and sort of held out his hand and sort of declaimed in a 
in an almost a classical fashion. Um, but there definitely is a, as I say in the book, I think sort of the, the, the build of a middleweight boxer. Who were his best friends back then? Well, his great mentor, um, who's, who's a few years younger, in fact, is James Otis, who's a pyrotechnic orator, um, had graduated from Harvard a few years before Adams, very much serves as his political mentor. It's Otis who first argues a case of writs of assistance in court. It's Otis who first, I, I think, gives Adams a sense of where colonial resistance might fit into the system. Um, the two of them, it's a difficult relationship, I should add, because Otis has clearly got a touch of some kind of mania. He's a man who can speak, who can talk a blue streak, as John Adams makes clear, and ultimately will um, descend into some kind of madness. And Adams, who's very loyal, can often be loyal to a fault, um, will try very hard to integrate Otis into some of the later committees and, and, and efforts at resistance be, and, and do everything he can to make sure that no one in any way offends um, his former mentor, even though he knows that, A, Otis is very difficult company and also very unpredictable. Otis will um, have Tory days and Whig days and um, at some point say he he will defend the Stamp Act and then he will just shred the Stamp Act. He's extremely, um, he, he's clearly maniacal. At, he's clearly got a, got a touch of mania and he's extremely fickle. Um, and I suppose that among the other closest would be Dr. Warren, who's the person who sends um, Paul Revere off to warn John Hancock and Samuel Adams that they're likely to be arrested um, in 1775. And John Adams who's a very close associate for these years. John Adams, like John Hancock, are people whom Adams himself had recruited. And in fact, it was said of Adams that if for no other reason um, he would be a shining patriot for the fact that he ran a sort of informal recruiting office for the American Revolution. Whenever there was a promising young man in Boston, whenever any Harvard graduate gave a particularly compelling speech on liberty, he could be certain that he would be getting a visit from Samuel Adams. Uh, I should admit to you, not that this is a big deal, but I've been reading The Galley, which came out some time ago. And the reason I mention this, because back in the back in your end notes, there's a quote that I want to ask you about, but I can't tell you exactly what page it came from. And I, I assume you'll remember this and put it in context. I'll read it. Quote, persons who relish flattery, S.A. feared, meaning Samuel Adams feared, will forever be deceived by those who design to deceive them. I'll stop with that. Do you remember? <laughs> do you remember that? I love that. I, I, I just, can we just stop and say how delighted I am that you're reading the end notes? It's, that, that, that makes every writer's day. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that that had something to do with John Hancock. Well, let me, let, me read, Han let me read on, on some more because it okay, makes ahead. more sense. Samuel Adams was frankly astounded that his countrymen should install as their first elected governor someone variously described as, and here come the quotes, all caprice, incapacity, and in indolence, a man of straw, a purveyor of quackery and exaggeration, a court sycophant, one of the most egregious triflers I know. I do love the egregious trifler one, right? <laughs> I, I, think the, I think the only one missing from there is the, the foppish pseudo-aristocrat, which one of his own biographers calls Hancock. Um, it's hard to find a kind word for John Hancock among um, certainly among those who write about Samuel Adams, but often even among his contemporaries. The, the two have this extremely uneasy relationship. Um, Adams banks very early on on the fact that John Hancock, who's inherited a tremendous fortune in, in his late 20s, will thrill to the attention of political office and that the, that the opposition party will thrill to John Hancock's fortune. And so he essentially recruits Hancock and helps him to be elected to the Massachusetts House of Representatives. And thereafter, the two have a, um, a sort of a teacher mentor, sort of mentor student relationship, but we will fall apart at various junctures. And it will often fall apart. Hancock is extremely thin skinned, Samuel Adams, extremely thick skinned. And Adams will very often be in a position of having to remind John Hancock that he shouldn't be discouraged because someone said, um, an unkind thing about him. Hancock will um, nurse his wounds. Adams will um, jump to 
to, to apply salve to them. But the two most often fall out in Hancock's bids for attention. He's very, very attuned to flattery. He can't seem to get enough um, applause. And he becomes a sort of, um, he, he, he can't, he's extremely generous with the town of Boston, but he can't seem to do enough to ingratiate himself with the town of Boston. So he will bestow all kinds of things, church bells, trees, um, all, all kinds of gifts on the town of Boston and la- and so enjoy the attention and the gratitude that he that he's able to buy. And Adams rails against this. Adams has a very hard time generally with anyone who's susceptible to flattery. And John Hancock seems in many ways the worst representation of that. And the two of them will, will be off speaking terms at, at various junctures in the early 1770s. Just after the Boston Massacre, there are a few years where the resistance effort entirely stutters and stalls. Adams is still at it. No one else is. And Thomas Hutchinson very cannily detaches John Hancock from Adams to the point where Hancock says that he hopes never again to see Adams or ever, ever speak to him again. And Hancock at that point is in part bought off by a cadet corps, a, a group of sort of ceremonial cadets that Hutchinson arranges for him. And John Hancock goes off and spends a lot of time ordering uniforms and ordering musical instruments for his cadets, which tells you something of the difference between the two men. I, uh, I suspect that people are listening to this saying, you know, I'm, I'm not getting the gist of uh, Adams like I would, and maybe we're just tricking them to go buy your book. Um, but Yeah, I think we should never, I think we should just never discuss the gist of it. No. Let him go buy the book. I mean, you know, cough it up. It's ready. You know, she. But by the way, I want at this point, I want to ask you about that, because you have had a rollout on this book. Every major newspaper reviews, mostly all positive, everything about it. Uh, how much of that did you expect? Oh, Brian, I don't think you ever know what to expect. I think I think you just go into publication season, you know, hoping that someone one person out there is going to read the book um, is going to read the book that you hope you that you think you might have written. Um, I don't think one ever knows what to expect. And I don't even think you necessarily know you don't I, I'm always fascinated by and, and sometimes and often thrilled by the fact that readers respond to different to, readers respond to parts of the book that I wouldn't have expected them to respond to and find things in the book that I didn't necessarily know were there. But I, I just think of you know, it's like your own family. You have the least, you're the person least able um, to explain what the book is or least able to actually objectively say this book works or this book doesn't work. Can you remember some reaction that a, a, a reader has had that you were surprised about specifically? I, I think I have been um, thrilled by the affection for him. I mean, I felt a great, I felt a great tenderness always and a great, I mean, obviously, this book were out of tremendous admiration, which only got greater as I worked. And it's been thrilling to see that other people see it that way, too, that the tenacity that uh, that Adams demonstrates here through thick and thin um, is something to which people are, which which is something to which people themselves, everyone is responding very warmly. So that's, that's been great. You know, I, I just think we have such a as with all historical events, we tend to look back at the American Revolution as a set of very um, measured maneuvers, one of which followed neatly after another. And obviously, it's a much more anarchic process than that. It's a messy process. And pulling it apart like this um, gives you a somewhat different revolution. And I think it's, I mean, it's been great for me to have people say, I didn't know any of this, or this isn't the way I learned um, you know, I thought it, I thought things proceeded directly from the Stamp Act to the Boston Tea Party, that the, that there were seven, 17 chapters in between was something of which I was unaware. And, and I just see you know, a plotting. I, I started with this a sort of epiphany moment of, wait a minute, we all know that Paul Revere is riding off. But which one, which of us actually thinks about where is he riding and to have people say, oh, my goodness, I never thought about that. I've never I you've actually sort of utterly you've cast Revere's ride in a different light that's thrilling to me because that's you know that's why I do this you mentioned earlier that not, uh, some people don't read your end notes or your footnotes what is your experience with that because it looks like 
once you've done your book and you have to do end notes, that that's a very painful process. I'm so glad you understand that. It's the worst. It's called special end note hell. And it's called just take your coffee consumption and multiply by three. I haven't figured out a way to do this. I mean, end notes are basically for me, the source notes. Footnotes are little bits of things on the page, which fall out of or further explicate the the paragraph itself. The end notes are the source notes. And when I'm writing, I don't really want to stop and write a fully formed source note. So I leave sort of skeletal, a skeletal trail for myself, which I'll pick up on later, which will become end notes. But of course, then one day, one day comes, and usually there are not enough days for it, where you have to flesh out those skeletal end notes. And by that time, of course, you've amassed a tremendous amount of information and not everything is obvious. Not, not everything is as obvious to you as it was at the time. And you're often sort of tracking down and notes that you had um, that you had put in a very simplified form in the book. Um, so it is a it is an exercise in kind of tremendous gun to the head, um, last minute panic. But it's also kind of thrilling because it's kind of re- it's kind of deconstructing the book at the same time. And being able to see what actually, you know, it's it, how, what straw you actually wove together to make this particular basket, for lack of a better metaphor. Um, and of course, within those notes, to those notes, you can add those little pieces of the book that your editor thought you should perhaps, were not necessarily germane to the story that you could perhaps live without, but that you absolutely want to include. So you can stick those, you can cheat a little by sticking those in the, in the end notes as well. You quoted Ralph Waldo Emerson in the 12th chapter, uh, this important, glorious crisis. The hero is he who is immovably centered. Why that quote? If there's nothing else that, by that point in the book, if there's nothing else for which Adam seems to have distinguished himself, his sheer tenacity would seem to distinguish him. By that point, you you know, you've, you've sort of been up and back again with this question of, what resistance will add up to in the colonies. Um, the word, in, I'm not even sure which chapter that is, is the word independence yet on the table? Really, what 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 are we looking for? Are we looking for redress? Are we looking for resistance? Are we looking for independence? And Adams is the one sort of unrelenting um, voice in Massachusetts at that point. So again, that was to just draw attention to how persevering he is, um, even while others have lost, um, have either sort of fallen away um, or have lost interest in the cause. Are you an Emerson fan? I am. How about you? Yeah, one of the best books. Uh, what was it? The Fire Next Time? What was the name? No, that's not the title of it. There was a book written years ago uh, that I interviewed on Book Notes about Emerson. I'm not a scholar. I'm just, <laughs> after all these years, I try to learn as much as I can. And I want to go back to Chapter 10 with you. I shall stand alone because I was... Uh, I was intrigued by Thomas Carlyle's quote, no man lives without jostling and being jostled. In all ways, he has to elbow himself through the world, giving and receiving offense. Thomas Carlyle, what about him? What about that quote? Well, I mean, leaving aside the fact that if I ha- didn't have a book to write, I wouldn't be reading Thomas Carlyle right now. Um, there's so much of Adams which is immensely high-minded and kind of eloquently sort of transporting, actually, intellectually. And then there's so much of Adams which is really just about low-ball tactics and not, of them, not all of them necessarily commendable, um, but a lot of maneuvering. You know, he obviously has this tremendous ability to change minds, but sometimes he does that in what we might consider a bull. Um, way and the tactics can be you know less than um, less than savory so that hence the Carlisle quote I can't remember which chapter that is but um, which has what happens to a writer when she's finished a book it's chapter but 10 I shall stand that, alone yeah I think that's the chapter where out of nothing Adam says has, has had this idea and maybe this will speak to what the book is actually about if you'll forgive me um, has had this idea that if the colonies could only hang together a little bit more tightly, if the infringed rights of one could be understood to be the infringed rights of all, something will categorically change in the colonial relationship. And that is an idea, obviously, which is not peculiar to him, 
but on which he harps for many, many years. After, um, after the Boston Tea Party, when there is the question of how Massachusetts is going to react um, to the request that they reimburse the East India Company for the tea, he manages in this unbelievably conniving manner to turn a committee that was meant to discuss the reimbursement of the tea into a committee um, that is going to discuss sending men to a continental Congress. And he does that by essentially making sure that the few people in the room, and in particular the one lawyer in the room, who are opposed to the idea are kept out of the discussion. So essentially he has a committee and then he has a shadow committee. And in a very agile way, he manages to get rid of this this person in particular who made a very would, would have made a very strong case for reimbursing the East India Company and manages to have a vote taken and passed to send a delegation to Philadelphia in this in this colleague's absence. And that's the kind of maneuvering um, at which he's so expert. And it's, you know, it's not all of it commendable, but it seemed to me that, that the Carlisle quote spoke directly to it. One of my... Uh Bet our favorite uh, footnotes, not not an end note, was uh, near the end of the book, and I want to kind of go through it and get your reaction to it. <clears throat> it uh, it's on page three twenty three of the book I'm looking at, and it starts out by no one spent more time afterward apportioning credit than John Adams, who early on fumed that Washington and Franklin would see all the glory and that the history of the revolution would, quote, be one continued lie from one end to the other, unquote. I'm going to do more of that after you respond to that, but uh, that doesn't sound too friendly. Uh, friendly on my part, you mean? No, on, oh. on the part of John <laughs> Adams. <laughs> I, I mean, there, John Adams is, you know, because he's a very petulant character, he is therefore immensely quotable. I mean, he's, he, he never meets someone without leaving an incredibly waspish and excellent description of what they're actual, what that person is actually like. And he does spend um, more time than anyone else going back over these events, locating the various Rubicons, of which there are many in his, in his telling, um, assigning credit, um, undermining other people who will claim credit, but essentially rewriting the revolution as he thought it should have been re- as he thought it should have been written. And remember, it's it's John Adams who will write to Samuel later and say, you know, those forty years of your writing will explain the American Revolution. Everyone's going to want to read those papers. You need to collect them because John is very aware of how much how essential all of this is. What essential reading this all is for posterity, and he's positioning himself for. Um, the embrace of posterity. He's preening for the future. And that is something in which Samuel absolutely refuses to engage. He never um, he never makes a gesture, to, so far as we know, um, toward accommodating John on that front. Whereas John, even from an earlier age, has been wondering how he's going to, how he's going to make his mark and how is he going to be remembered and how is he going to get out from under the shadows of Benjamin Franklin and George Washington. More, more and the from, answer is by writing a better letter than any of the rest of them. <laughs> more from your, your footnote. Uh, you say Jefferson had been nowhere on the scene when James Otis launched his crusade against British overreach. Otis had electrified uh, 1761 Boston, quote, more than Patrick Henry ever did in the whole course of his life, unquote. By 1817, Adams, that's a quote from Adams, but by 1817, Adams had settled on Hancock, Otis, and Samuel Adams as the founding triumvirate. Well, you know, a lot of this is the shifting back and forth over who should deserve more credit, New England or Virginia. And that's pretty much the contest in John Adams' mind. It annoys him. Much has been given to Virginia at the Continental Congress because the New Englanders are understood by the rest of the colonists to be sort of, you know, very fanatical, fire-breathing fanatics. Whereas the Virginians seem to, who are of the same mind, seem to be somewhat more mild-mannered and they are less prickly than than was, for example, John Adams. So this will explain, as John Adams tells us, why George Washington commanded the troops and why Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence and why Richard Henry Lee proposed the Declaration of Independence, because those things were entrusted to the more moderate seeming Virginians. But afterwards, it will be very much in a very sort of chauvinistic way, 
um, the Adams men will very much feel as if New England was leading the charge, as in fact it was. And there is a certain clawing back that you're hearing there um, on John Adams's part of, of the supremacy of Massachusetts. Near the end of the book, you talk about Samuel Adams collapsing uh, when he was on the floor. And I guess it's the house. I'm, I've lost my place in this. But at the end, what kind of what kind of an end was it in his life? It's a it's to me a very um, it's a very poignant end. It's as if he's clearly his health is suffering to some extent. He outlives his time. He lives to he lives through into his eighties, and he has lost touch really with the country that he has done so much to create. So he's out of step with it. He he isn't a federalist. He never holds national office, as we said. Um, he's still looking back, thinking that the the the, the more the more modest and simple old world is where he's hoping the country is headed, whereas it's rushing on to a very mercantile and, and luxurious future. Um, he's, he's seen as something of a relic in Boston, where he's deeply respected for his courage and his nobility and his tenacity through those essential years, but where he's also seen as very much a creature of the past. And watching him fall out of step like that, and, and it, yes, at that point collapse to the floor, um, I find heartrending. The reason the last chapter is is short is that although it's it's quite a long period of time, um, he talks about revolution. He meets with dignitaries who come to Boston. At one point, he John and John Adams will entertain George Washington. But there's that ability to connect men and to corral thinking and to and to sort of just pull ideas out of the air and commit them to the page really has deserted him by those years. How do you, what's your reaction to this period of a book where you have to go out and, I don't know if you have to, but you go out and sell it. What do you think of this, of doing all these interviews and speeches and whatnot? Well, I love talking to Brian Lamb. Let me make that clear. I think that it's a, you know, it's it's an interesting one. You've, you've written in insofar as you are capable, you have written your, you've given your best shot at it on the page. So then everything that you say about it, by definition, you're mangling your own account. So I feel as if what you really want to do is direct the reader to the page, but it's kind of a catch-22 because you can't be there without talking about it. I find it thrilling to actually speak to people who are reading the book, as I said, because you're suddenly finding that there are things in the pages that you hadn't yourself necessarily seen. And because you're sharing this person with whom, about whom you feel so passionately. But I always have the sense that I'm vaguely bungling it. <laughs> Final um, moment here on, on this. Which you, can, which you can now confirm that I've done. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, after our technical failures, I don't think you've bungled it at all. Anyway, the la kind of the last question of this particular segment of our conversation. If you were to put your finger on the one thing that Samuel Adams did during this revolutionary period that made the biggest difference, what was it? I suppose I would say that this real kind of campaign of modern you know, civil resistance, the, the, the orations, the recruiting, the boycotts, the pickets, the extra legal meetings. I mean, it's really sort of an astonishingly modern invention, which he creates out of whole cloth and which utterly reorganizes, invigorates and reorganizes um, colonial resistance. And I, I think that is really almost entirely his doing and strikingly original. The name of the book is The Revolutionary Samuel Adams. Our guest has been Stacy Schiff. Thank you very much for all your time. Thank you, Brian. And now part two of the discussion with Stacy Schiff about Samuel Adams, The Revolutionary. It's a little bit complicated. When we first interviewed Stacy Schiff, we did it by phone and a special hookup, and we had technical problems. So it became disjointed and spotty. And because of that, we asked her if she would do it again. In the process of that, though, we had different information in the two different interviews. So as an extra for this podcast, we're adding parts of the discussion we had with Stacy Schiff originally about two weeks before we did the second recording. Let's start with Samuel Adams. Who was he? 
he is um he's a deeply profoundly pure and idealistic character who has for various reasons which I hope we can talk about gone missing but who's really instrumental in encouraging what John Adams referred to his cousin John Adams referred to as the the real American revolution the revolution in thinking that precedes the revolution in fighting and I think you I think it's fairly easy to make the argument that over the 10 or 12 years leading up to 1776 he is as his contemporaries all agreed the man of the hour the most active um, the most persevering uh, man of the revolution as Thomas Jefferson put it describe him um, a little hapless. Um, I find it endearing, and I guess it's at least interesting, that he is for the first four decades of his life pretty much useless in terms of a career. He graduates from Harvard with a BA, he goes back for a master's, and he then proceeds to run his family business into the ground. Um, he subsists largely on thin air. He doesn't really ever have a profession except for politics. And as colonial issues begin to heat up, in the 1760s, he is elected to the House of Representatives in Massachusetts. Um, his popularity is partly due to the fact that he had helped write and, and in many cases ghost write other people's prose. And over the next years, he is um, engaged both as a member of the House and on his own um, in essentially wrangling with British legislation and crystallizing American thinking, I guess is the quickest way to put it. Um, so he wrote prolifically over those years. And insofar as one can describe him, I would say a very charming, by every account, charismatic, easygoing man, who when push came to shove, could also be something of a street brawler and very tough-minded and very sharp-elbowed. What were those first 41 years like? You know, it's, we have so little about those first 41 years. It's kind of fascinating. He's, he's downwardly mobile. He comes from, from a wealthy family. Um, his father entrusts him with a great sum of money at one point, which he seems to manage to squander. Um, he briefly takes over the family business, which was in um, curing malt for, for beer and for other things. Um, because there is an early collision with imperial authority, um, the family is itself ruined. So he's grown up amid much wealth and he no longer is, is living with it. Um, he marries once and has two children and then his, and then, and then his wife dies. He re remarries a second time. And really we have very little trace of him over those years except for the fact that he, um, A, is a market clerk, which means he spends a lot of time in the streets of Boston and therefore getting to know most of the, much of the town. And B, and probably most pertinently, um, he is he takes a job as a Boston tax collector. And you can imagine that given the kind of financially not so astute person I've just described, you can imagine how well he acquits himself of that, of that job. He winds up massively in debt on the tax collection. He seems to have been, um, he seems to have taken the job because of his easygoing and genial personality and never really pushed anyone, pushed anyone to actually produce the taxes he was meant to collect. And so he winds up, given the way the system worked at the time, massively in debt for an enormous sum of money. When you were growing up in a town named after him, did you know that? I knew the town was named for Samuel Adams. My brother insisted it was named for John Adams. Of course, I'm right as always. Um, but in the middle of town, um, in the middle of town was the public library in Adams where I spent a great deal of time. Um, and in front of the library, right in the town square, time sort of circle in the middle of town, is a statue, which I always, through my childhood, assumed was a statue of Samuel Adams. And only when I was a teenager did I realize it was actually, it was William McKinley. So uh, some of us grew up with, you know, clearer and less clear ideas of Samuel Adams. When you were growing up, did anybody talk about Samuel Adams and the re relationship with the, that, that community you were in? If so, um, if so, I wasn't around for those conversations. And, and I think that was, there were many things that drove me to write the book, but there was some embarrassment on my part that I should come from Adams, Massachusetts and know nothing about Samuel Adams. He, he makes a cameo in my book about Ben Franklin's years in France. And even then, even though I'd written about him sort of peripherally, I didn't really know much about him. Gonna jump way ahead just for the moment. John Hancock and Samuel Adams ended up in Lexington, Massachusetts on a very important night. Why were they there together and what happened? <laughs> 
Um, they're there together because they are both members of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, um, which at this point is meeting outside of Boston for its own protection. It is an extra legal assembly. It's an assembly that that has been put together essentially to keep it out of the reach of General Gage, who is at this moment, and I'm backing up a bit here, General Gage has taken over as governor of Boston as part of the punishment to the town of Boston for having destroyed the East India Company's tea. Um, because of that, one of, the, um, one of the punishments which Gage is there to enforce is to make sure that there are no there are no meetings of the town. This is to cut back, obviously, on any kind of resistance. So the town um, essentially organizes, Adams and his colleagues organize these extra legal meetings of a provincial congress of their own, a provincial meeting of their own. And Hancock and Adams had been at that meeting. They are then scheduled to ride to, for early in early May south to the meeting of the Continental, the first meeting of the Continental Congress. Um, I'm sorry, to the second meeting of the Continental Congress. And they are that night... Um, in a parson in the parsonage in the town of Lexington. You want me to keep going, or did you want to well, drop just, it a hint there? No, I just want to ask you a question. Thomas Gage at that time was British. Were the others still British? Everyone is British at that point. Mm-hmm. People have certainly people use the word American. People say, you know, we in America or American rights are being infringed. But everyone is still British. Makes it very hard to write about that period of time, by the way. But yes, everyone is everyone is British. So Thomas Gage is there because of the king designated him for that. Thomas partic- Gage has yeah. I mean, the, the question comes up obviously after the Boston Tea Party. The pertinent question is how to discipline Boston for what the crown sees as essentially a riot. They have this. This is an act of vandalism. You know, pr- private property has been destroyed. So, and this is obviously not the first offense. There have been many acts of resistance. How finally to discipline these obstreperous Bostonians? And, you know, there has tea sent to other ports in America, but Boston is, for various reasons, the only town that destroys its tea. And Thomas Gage, um, who, has, who has had more experience in America than any other commanding officer, um, essentially says, I can, put this thing, I, I, I can put this thing to rest with, you know, very few men. Just send me over and I'll take care of it. And so he comes with a very, un, the very sort of unhappy um, orders to both calm the town and close its port to future to, to any kind of business. So he's basically there to, to dole out the most severe punishment possible. Everything is now going to have to be carted to Boston by land. Um, all business in Boston, which is obviously very sea dependent, is going to close. There are going to be shortages of all kinds. So he's there to dole out a really um, extremely strict punishment. And obviously that is yet again a moment in a series of British sort of overreactions that will inflame the colonists. So does Thomas Gage know Samuel Adams and John Hancock? In the spring of 1775, um, Gage is in Boston. Um, Hancock and Adams are very much aware of the fact that their arrests are possible. Um, It's a sort of... It's a game of cat and mouse in a way that they're playing in the sense that to arrest any of these patriot leaders would have been considered an act of aggression, possibly an act of war by some people. On the other hand, Gage knows that if he could just think, if he could just arrest these, these most prominent of the malefactors, he could put down this little, um, this little rebellion. So there's a, there's a great difference of opinion here as to what to do. And Gage clearly goes back and forth with the question of should he arrest, should he not arrest um, but, by, but by April of, um, of 1775, he has received orders that he is to arrest Adams and Hancock. Um, it's at that moment that, um, and, they, they have, and they have had advance word that those are the orders. So they are essentially secreting themselves in Lexington at the home of the, um, uh, of the minister up in the village. And this is the moment at which Paul Revere obviously rides out to tell them that um, the British are heading their way. As you know, if you Google the name John Hancock or Samuel Adams, on Adams you'll get a beer and on Hancock you'll get an insurance company. <laughs> Who was John? I've, Who? I've, I've only ever Googled Samuel Adams, but I've never got Googled John Hancock, so that had not occurred to me. That's quite funny. But who was he and what was he like? Hancock and Adams are fascinating as a duo because they really are the ultimate odd couple. 
Um, Hancock is an, ex- is an extremely wealthy younger man. Adams actually recruits him. And we should actually talk about the fact that one thing that does distinguish Adams or one contribution that Adams makes is as a recruiting agent. Many of the names we know are patriots who he recruits. Um, but Hancock is a younger man um, who inherits a colossal fortune. He's one of the, he's one of the richest men in New England. Um, when he's, when his, he's, he's been orphaned and he's adopted by an uncle. Um, and he is as obsessed with um, his own importance and his own wardrobe and his place in the world as Adams is indifferent to those things. So they are really just ultimately mismatched and yet partners in crime, um, in part because Adams has sponsored John Hancock's political rise. He's helped him to get elected to the House of Representatives in the first place. And because, his, because Hancock's fortune has very often come in handy um, with much of the resistance movement. And in fact, when I said Adams had been a, a very hapless tax collector at one point, there's an effort made by a group of friends to bail him out, and John Hancock is the single greatest donor to that fund. And what was the difference in their age? You know, I'm suddenly forgetting. I think it's 13 years. So they're, they're in Lexington, and is the story of Paul Revere that we've all grown up with accurate? The story of Paul Revere, with which we've all grown up, assuming you're talking about the story and not the poem, is indeed accurate. The thing that occurred to me as I was reading about this and writing Paul Revere's accounts of and reading Paul Revere's accounts of this, is that we none of us really, I think, stops to ask where was Paul Revere going that night, Um, and we just know that he's leaving Boston on his horse, but where he's going, um, or where he's sent by a doctor in Boston who's one of the closest Confederates and Adams' closest friend, is to warn Adams and Hancock that they are likely to be arrested. They think that the troops that are being sent, that this mission that's being sent out of Boston to round up Adams and Hancock. Now, it's an interesting question, by the way, to which we don't have the actual answer. That is Dr. Warren who dispatches um, Paul Revere's understanding. That is obviously Paul Revere's understanding because he's told as much and it is in also General Gage's orders from, from London. But it is, doesn't seem to be entirely what General Gage had in mind that day, because if it were, he would not have been marching out the regiments that he does. So there's a little bit of a mismatch between what we know the orders from London to have been and the orders that Gage gives to his men. I wrote down all the acts, A-C-T, Sugar Act, Stamp Act, Townsend Act, uh, of course, the Boston Massacre, Tea Act, Boston Tea Party, Coercive Acts. How did you keep track of all these and what were they? In many ways, they're all of them aiming at the same thing. They're aiming at imperial control of colonial interests. Obviously, the Sugar and the Stamp Acts are revenue-raising acts. And the Townsend Act, um, and between them, just let's not forget, there's a Declaratory Act. Um, Essentially, what you have here is just a moment in time where the Crown is immensely interested in asserting its right to taxation, even if it doesn't tax a specific item. So, for example, when the Stamp Act is repealed, the Declaratory Act is put in place just to prove the principle. And by the time the Tea Act comes around, by the time tea lands in Boston, the only item on which duty remains is tea. And that duty has remained, again, purely for, as a means to assert the principle of taxation. And that's really the, cru- the crux of the matter is that the Crown wants to basically say, we legislate all affairs in the colonies. Um, the colonies disagree with that interpretation. And both sides are dancing around this issue for, for a decade. Much of the difficulty comes from the fact that that relationship is never really entirely codified. Um, Parliament isn't even mentioned in the, in the Massachusetts Charter. So a lot of this is almost guesswork of how, you know, how do the colonies fit into the empire? Who has, how far do colonial rights extend? Everyone is just vying to define the relationship. And all of those acts are attempts on the Crown's part to say, here's how it's defined. And obviously, most of them meet with re- various, all of them meet with resistance. Most of them meet with much resistance especially on the part of Massachusetts, which has one of them, which is more independently constructed than many of the, than most of the other colonies. How visible was uh, Samuel Adams in Boston? 
that's a really um, hard thing to say. I think most people, certainly everyone knew who he was. Um, he has established a reputation as being, depending on your point of view, um, heroic or difficult. Um, much of the material that I think is most useful about him comes from the Crown officials, um, who obviously found him impossible and who would have liked to have done away with him long before um, Lexington and Concord. Um, the descriptions, their descriptions of him are you know, utterly delicious in the sense that they think he's really the villain of the piece. And most of them are convinced, um, and this is a formula that goes both ways, that if, if they could just get rid of these few hotheads, um, and especially Samuel Adams, everything would go back to normal. And, of course, the Americans are convinced that they could just get few, rid of a few of these hotheads in London, everything would go back to normal. Um, while, of course, different, different feelings are welling up under the surface, and quite a, quite a bit of the population is obviously enmeshed in the, in the, in the, in the resistance movement. Best I can tell, in 1776, the Boston had a population of about 25,000. What was it like? I think it's. I think that's actually large. I think it's closer to sixteen thousand. But but yes, by our standards today, small townish. Um, it's it's a it, it's a town that had been more prosperous than it was. It had, it had fallen on harder times. It had been been out begun to be outpaced by New York and Philadelphia. It's very much a maritime um, center. Um, the the port, the wharfs are really where where the activity is. It is a beautiful town. No, even no, no British officer arrives in Boston and fails to say how beautiful it is. Um, it's a very sophisticated town. Um, it is markedly and obviously essentially the town in America with the greatest number of newspapers, which has a great deal to do with what's going to happen. Um, it is foremost in terms of higher education. It was always the envy of Thomas Jefferson in terms of its educational system. Um, it's a very literate town, obviously. And it was, a, it was a town in which you could, you know, buy a harpsichord or a, or a, a bunch of Malaga lemons. I mean, it was a very, um, it was a town that traded with the rest of the world and had, um, there was a great deal of finery in Boston. It was a very, it was a very civilized address. You told us earlier how Samuel Adams made his money <coughs> or lost his money in his first 40 years or so. How did he sustain himself uh, when he got active uh, against the British? He just barely ekes out a living first in the job as the market clerk. Later, he makes a little bit of money on his tax commissions, although obviously that's not substantial. He seems to have, have subsisted after that largely on the charity of friends. And we have no trace of who they were. There are intimations um, that Hancock played um, a crucial role in supporting him. Um, and certainly when things sour between the two men, there are a few kind of acid comments about you know how, how dare he, you know, the hand that fed him. Um, perhaps one of the most um, colorful accounts of, of Samuel Adams comes as he is about to venture to Philadelphia for the Continental Congress. And we know from other accounts that because he has no money, he's ill-shot and ill-dressed and you know, sort of a shabby figure around town. But, but in the days preceding his trip south, arrives at his household in succession the best tailor in Boston, the best hatter in Boston, the best shoemaker in Boston, each of whom calls at his home to take his measures. And several days later appears on the doorstep a large trunk with a new wardrobe for him for his trip. And we have this from two different accounts, which, which vary slightly, in fact. Um, but it was meant to be proof of how cherished he was, how many good friends he had, how many benefactors he had in town. And my guess is, if you had to really guess, that chief among those was John Hancock. This is a bit of a cliche, but I still want to ask you, if you had a chance to sit and talk with him and ask him questions, what would you, where would you start? I have so many questions for this man. Um, I, think it, I think there are two things that preoccupied me as I was working on the book. The first, obviously, is okay, who really masterminded the Boston Tea Party? Um, it all signs point to Adams. Um, Thomas Hutchinson, the royal governor, will say that Adams was, in his, was never in greater glory than the day after the Tea Party. Um, when people are deposed in London, they, are, they always name Adams among the chief perpetrators of, at that, that day. He's very conspicuously not on the wharf when the tea is destroyed. He and the other town meeting leaders are, are still at the Old South Meeting House. So he really 
has made very clear that he has nothing to do with this in a way that would indicate that he had everything to do with this. So the question of how the decision to destroy the tea and who actually did it would be would be on top of my list. And I think the other question with which we grapple, and I think this is true of many of the um, of the of the players in the story, is when does resistance when does the idea that resistance is necessary turn into rebellion? When do you actually decide not just we have grievances against the crown, we need to rediscuss and re-regulate this legislation, but we actually need to separate from the mother country? Because that's a pretty radical step. And many people have assumed that Adams makes that step in 1768, which is when troops first arrive in Boston, which could be a logical juncture, but we have we have nothing on paper that proves that that is the moment that puts him over the edge. And everyone else, it's really interesting if you look back at the literature, everyone else will discuss a Rubicon. My Rubicon was here. Here was the Rubicon for so-and-so. Adams never actually uses that expression. Um, he never says that this was the moment that he actually decided that the colony should be independent. Check me on my dates. Boston Tea Party in 1773. Work back to the Boston Massacre in 1770. How much did he have to do with the massacre, and what was it? The Boston Massacre is um, is a collision, obviously, between armed forces and civilians who've been living together very uncomfortably for months. Um, forces have been sent to Boston, to regiments have been sent to Boston to tame the town, to basically um, basically make basically tamp down this resistance movement. Um, Adams has not done anything physical, but he has done everything in his power to exacerbate that occupation. Um, obviously, no one is pleased to have troops among them. Um, that idea that troops should not be sta- a standing army should not be stationed among um, among a peaceful people is enshrined in the Declaration of Independence. I mean, this was a huge insult. Um, and Adams spends the months, those months of occupation, helping with friends to churn out article after article about the abuses and the harassments and the missteps um, of, the, of the soldiers in town, most of which would appear to be fictitious. But he does something um, quite remarkable, which is that this series of sort of news items, these very sensationalistic, lurid news items, which are called the Journal of Occurrences, are dispatched south to New York and then from there to Philadelphia, where they're reprinted. So they're inflaming other colonies. And then only at the at the end of that are they then printed in Boston, by which time nobody is really certain if they actually happened or remotely happened or half happened. So it's this almost tabloid press with which he's involved, um, which has a tremendous effect in inflaming tempers and against which the crown officers are, are railing because they can see the damage it's doing and because they're warning throughout, you know, something there's going to be a major collision of some kind if this continues. And in fact, obviously, in March of 1770, after a number of sort of street brawls, um, soldiers will fire um, on civilians and, and five people are, are, are killed, um, which, is the, which is the moment we know is the Boston Massacre. And to answer your question, after that, what Adams, Adams lays very low during the trials. He tries very hard to see that the trials take place immediately after March 5th. When tempers are are very very when tempers are flaring, and in that he is opposed by Thomas Hutchinson, the acting governor, who is doing his best to delay the trials as much as possible to see that justice is served, and and Hutchinson will win out. The trials don't place till, don't take place until October, and after that Adams does something which is which is equally remarkable. Almost everyone is acquitted. Two soldiers, in fact, are are convicted. Everyone else is acquitted, but Adams will then retry. Um, the case in the press in a series of very compelling, very sensational articles um, where he basically, the town has quieted and he is essentially trying to relitigate and to reinflame Boston. Did he put his own name on these articles? Uh, I should have mentioned that. Thank you. No, he doesn't. Most of those articles he publishes as Vindex. But he has a sort of suitcase of pseudonyms. He has at least 30. There may be more. I haven't counted pseudonyms. Um, It's unclear why he uses some of them. Sometimes he's Alfred. Sometimes he's Shippen. He's very often Candidus. 
He goes back and forth. He sometimes publishes under different pseudonyms and different papers at the same time. Sometimes if someone opposes something and they sign them, pseudonyms were, were very much in use at the time. So if someone else signed a piece, TK, and Adams wanted to respond to that piece, he would reverse the initials, he would just write as KT. Um, so there are a whole variety um, of pseudonyms, and it's, it's very much the manner of the day, but he takes it to, to quite the extreme. How were you able to identify when he actually wrote a piece? There are three ways, essentially. One is that a great number of his um, pieces have been published as, as the writings of Samuel Adams, which had been identified by family members. The second is that um, he sometimes recycles his own prose. So if we, if we see his sentences in a letter, and then we see them again in an article, which sounds very much like him, it's, it seems a pretty sure bet that, that this was indeed he. And then the third, and, and I think the most intriguing way, um, there was a marvelous hardware store owner whom, whom Bernard Balin brought to all of our attention named Harbottle Door, who very early in the 1760s realizes that something is afoot, that the temperature, the colonial temperature is changing. And, and he sort of sees that, that, you know, history is somehow asserting itself here. He begins to make a collection of newspapers, which he, in his spare time, annotates in a somewhat obsessive, compulsive, kind of crazy quilt way. Um, and he very often identifies Samuel Adams at the top of a piece. So sometimes we have Harbottle Doors' little charming little marking, S. Adams, at the top of a column. And that has been part of what has helped us to trace these pieces back to Adams. Other characters that you wrote about that you found interesting? My heart is in so many ways with, and I continue to be utterly fascinated by Thomas Hutchinson. And Thomas Hutchinson is, at the beginning of the book, the lieutenant governor, soon to be the acting governor, and ultimately the royal governor. Um, and he is, I, I, I think it's fair to say, the, Adams' is chief antagonist through these years. And it's just a, it's a remarkable, um, it's a remarkable match between the two of them in that Hutchinson stands for everything that Adams abhors. He stands for hereditary privilege. He's spent his life um, handing out offices, if not taking them for himself. It's a, uh, Massachusetts is, a very, is run by a very tight, intermarried, wealthy circle of families. And Hutchinson is very much at the center of that. And the two of them have, a complete, have very similar backgrounds. They have very similar educations. And they end up on completely different sides of the issue of what, um, of what is right. And so I would say that the, the interplay between the two of those and watching Hutchinson try to grapple with Adams, whom he just doesn't understand and who's kind of running circles around him and just manipulating everything in a way that Hutchinson can't quite get his mind around, um, was fascinating to me. I mean, Hutchinson is an utterly decent, upright, rational human being. And in a funny way, it's the very fact that he's so rational and so entrenched in his privilege that makes it impossible for him to understand what's happening around him. How unusual was it back then that Hutchison was born in the United States? It wasn't called that at the moment, I guess, but <clears throat> was born here but became loyal to the crown. Um, it's a good point. He's the first. He's the he's the only Massachusetts governor of these years who was American born. Exactly. Everyone else had been a a British placement or had been in, you know had been installed by the British. Um, but Hutchinson takes that responsibility very seriously. And his loyalty is to the crown. He doesn't see none of this really makes a great deal of sense to him. Um, he's very much outmaneuvered and, and at some points realizes he's outmaneuvered. I mean, the ultimate showdown is, is just after the Boston Massacre, the morning after the massacre, when uh, you know, Hutchinson has just barely been able to bring order back to the town after that, after that horrible evening. Everyone is up in arms, obviously. Um, there's blood being tracked through the streets. No one knows what's going to happen. Every, it's ex, ex, immensely explosive, and, and Hutchinson does his, his rational and authoritarian, authoritative best to calm things. But the next morning, um, he holds a meeting of, of the Crown officers and the council members who are in Boston, and the town also holds, holds a meeting from which it dispatches several people, including Adams, to Hutchinson to say, you must remove the soldiers from town. This, it's, it's, a, it's an impossible situation. There will be blood on every street. You must get rid of the soldiers. And it's the, this is a sort of sma very famous smackdown between Hutchinson and Adams, where Hutchinson initially says, I'll remove one regiment. 
Um, and Adams goes back to the meeting to report as much, and the meeting is unsatisfied. And again, Adams um, crosses Boston and, and insists that Hutchinson remove the 2nd Regiment as well, and he gets his way. He prevails, and Hutchinson is distraught. I mean, he's, he, he just, he's furious with himself that he has to concede as much. Uh, when, when was Thomas Hutchinson called back to Great Britain? Hutchinson is angling to go back for a leave of absence um, by the end of 1773, but he doesn't, he doesn't dare go because he um, is aware that if he leaves, let me start, let me start that again. Um, Hutchinson begins to realize not only that the House has opposed him, but that the upper chamber of the legislature, his council, has also come round um, and has allied, it is thinking with very much the same thoughts as, as the House. So he's basically a man out of step with his own government. Uh, he begins to lobby for a leave of absence, but he realizes um, that were he to take one, power messages would devolve to his council, who, of course, no longer are as respectful as the crown, of the crown as they should be. So he prolongs his stay in America, and he finally um, goes back, clearly a little shamefaced, but I think with some relief, I think it's fair to say, um, after the Boston Tea Party. You know, when I read your book, I kept thinking uh, about age and how these all these people you wrote about were compared to one another versus age. How would a Hutchison be compared to a Samuel Adams, compared to a John Adams uh, at, during that time? Hutchinson is, I think, 11 years older than Adams, um, and John Hancock, I think, 15 years younger than Adams, and John Adams also about, I think, he's 13 years younger than Samuel. Um, but, but, it, but I'm not sure how much those ages matter. Hutchinson had been essentially a member of the government since the age of 26, so from a very early age, he's kind of part of the establishment. Um, whereas Adams obviously had just frittered away those first decades. So in a funny way, the, the careers add up somewhat differently. Hutchinson certainly feels older because he speaks for the establishment at all times. Um, and he's always, he's always it's, it's necessary for him to parrot the party line. Go back to uh, the question about what you would ask Samuel Adams. What else would you want to hear from him? Um, there's clearly an enormous amount of, this is a man who could create a loophole out of thin cloth and then jump through it. So there's a, there's clearly a tremendous amount of maneuvering behind the scenes. Um, there are any number of occasions on which, um, a decision is made in the house because Samuel Adams happened to have had the document, you know, written out and in his pocket before anyone even voted or where, um, a decision is made behind locked doors because he's locked the door and the key is in his pocket. So I would love to know how some of that maneuvering took place. How, you know, how close was that inner circle of whom did it, we have some idea obviously, but of whom exactly did it consist? How did they manage to coordinate these, these efforts um, so brilliantly? I mean, there's a, there's a particularly brilliant manipulation when um, the question comes up of, whether or not Boston should pay for the tea, um, and this, and there are there are divided opinions. Some people think this was a glorious and sublime event, this destruction of the tea, which is how John Adams saw it, and other people think it was um, an absolutely unconscionable destruction of, of property, and that Boston should make amends immediately. And in the midst of those discussions comes the question of should there be a Continental Congress of some kind? Should there be a meeting of the colonies to discuss how we go forward? And Adams is clearly utterly instrumental in um, somehow manipulating everyone toward the Continental Congress. And the way he does that is to, we know from, from a colleague's account, is to um, pacify one of the men in the room who very much feels that Boston should make amends for the tea by telling him, you know, this is a very difficult decision we have before us, so we really can't rush it. We really should take our time. Um, he says all kinds of, I'm quoting here, smooth and placid things to, to calm this, this lawyer, actually. And then, what he may, and then what he does is he assigns someone to carry off the lawyer back to his hometown because of legal business presses terribly. And while he's gone... A shadow committee appoints a, appoints a group of representatives to attend a Continental Congress. So who helped him with those sort of backroom ministrations 
where he's on the one hand saying all the right things, giving lip service to this idea that, you know, yes, we really will consider making amends for the tea, and yet actually organizing um, a delegation for the Continental Congress. Did he ever pick up arms for uh, this uh, country during the... No, and, and one, of the, one of the many reasons um, for which he is forgotten, he's in Congress for an insanely long time, and I think he would have called it an insanely long time, too. But one of the reasons he's forgotten is that he, he doesn't fight. He is sitting in Congress making decisions or trying to make decisions. Um, he never holds federal office, and he is afterward in many ways largely out of step with the country that he helped to create. So participates in a funny way in his own reputational demise. The other thing that, that, he doesn't, that he does, which is not usually helpful either for his reputation or for us, is he destroys a great number of his papers. Um, there's no scene here that I had more trouble writing than John Adams describing Samuel Adams in Philadelphia at the Continental Congress, um, feeding his papers to the fire so that none of his, um, none of his colleagues could possibly be compromised. Obviously, everyone is, is at this point fomenting revolution and he doesn't want anyone to be to have to to be sent to to england to be prosecuted for that so he alternately john adams is telling either cuts his paper to shreds cuts his papers to shreds or feeds them to the fire so afterwards when john adams then says to him the world would really like a collection of your papers um adams never makes any effort to collecting anything so we have less from him than we have from any of the other founders um, and for that reason too, it's easy. It, it's it's harder to, to it's, it's harder to pull him out, and it's harder to point to his importance. What jo- political jobs did he have there in Boston and Massachusetts? He's a member of the House of Representatives, and he's on a tremendous number of committees. Um, Boston was a town of, run by committees, and where there, were, whenever you needed anything done, you had a you appointed a committee, and and probably in that in that sense, the most crucial are the committees that, involving the tea, the tea meetings. He's very active in organizing everything having to do with how to confront this issue of duty tea, which no one wants to unload in America because to do so is to is to accept um, the duty. And as he puts it, because I did not trust the private virtue of my countrymen to refrain from drinking the tea, I would prefer to trust them to reject the tea. I would prefer to trust to their public virtue in rejecting the tea. So he's on... He's on Committee after committee after committee. One of my favorite things is on page 115. And I'll start by reading a little bit about it. You'll know why um, when I read it. You say, soon after his election, Adams arranged for the House to construct a gallery. It went up in, in a matter of days. For the first time, the people of Massachusetts could observe their representatives in action you know where I'm headed on this. I mean, it sounded like today, but tell us what we're, <laughs> tell us what we're talking about. It's you know, it's just it's such a small um, decision, and it clearly had such a colossal effect. Um, he does exactly what you just said. He involves, he makes it possible um, for the first time for the people of Boston to observe their representatives in action, and that meant two things. That meant that they could actually see the discussions that were being made about um, all, all government matters. But it also meant that the elected officials were playing somewhat to the House. So you, you, have, an, you have the occasional account of people who are very disgruntled by this, by this novelty on Adams's part, who, who say, you know, they're now playing as if it were a theater. Is this a theater that, we, that we're now running? And obviously it does add a certain theatrical element to what's happening. But it underlines um, what was from the start Adams' motivation here, which is involving ordinary citizens um, in adjudicating for themselves. He believes that the people should have the power to see what's, what's being done by their elected officials and that when they are unhappy, they should make that unhappiness known and that you know, ordinary people, when they band together, have more power than they could ever have imagined. I'm going to read some more. With spectators came an escalation in language. Those on the floor played to the audience, speaking or speechifying to the visitors. Mm-hmm. The rabble, as Bernard saw them, and who was Bernard? 
he's the previous royal governor um, of Massachusetts and, and the one who had come with very high hopes for it being a very calm Massachusetts administration and immediately kind of runs the, the gauntlet with, um, with, with all of the fallout from the, leg- from the legislation of the 1760s. You also, and before I read the rest of you, you also men- mentioned a man named Otis. Who was he? James Otis is, um, is, I mean, the easiest way to describe him may be as Adams' mentor. Otis has, is, was an utterly brilliant, um, somewhat mentally unbalanced lawyer who had been at Adams' side, or I guess we would say Adams had been at his side from the earliest days, um, and who is the first to advance most of the ideas on which Adams will later um, stake most of his claims. He, he argues brilliantly in court, for example, against writs of assistance. He's a person whom the, whom the administration think is motivated by the fact that he didn't get a job that he had wanted or that, it, that his family was not given the, the job that it, that it wanted, but in fact is motivated really largely by principle. And that, too, becomes something of an issue here where no one can really, no one of the entrenched families can really understand entirely the motivation of the Samuel Adamses. They assume these are men who are in some way dispossessed, in some way down on their luck, and somewhat they're, they're desperados. This is why they're fighting for these things. It doesn't, it doesn't quite sink in that they're fighting for ideals in any way. And that's, that's something that takes Hutchinson, for example, completely by surprise. Okay. The, other, the other wonderful remark about the gallery that you mentioned, I don't know if this is in the part coming up, it's, it's, a, it's said to be the, the gallery where Adams hangs out with his mohawks in the, in, the, in the writing of one crown official. And that's funny because it's interesting because the mohawks, of course, are, um, become the shorthand for the people who destroy the tea at, um, in the harbor. The, the rest of this is, uh, and I was reading, the rabble as Bernard saw them, meaning the people in the gallery, could now listen to Otis rant for nearly two hours against the mighty men who formulated colonial law. He dismissed the House of Commons as a, quote, parcel of button makers, pen makers, horse jockeys, gamesters, pensioners, pimps, and whoremasters, unquote. And now, in that case, who is Otis talking about in the House of Commons where? He's, he's, th- this is, that is the, you know, perfect description of, at this point, um, what the colonists think who the colonists think is actually handing down legislation for them. This idea that these are people who are essentially feeding off of the riches of America, who are taxing America um, for reasons... Sorry, can you hear that in the background? Mm Mm-hmm, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, The idea that these people are exploiting America to their own ends and are are treating America as if it's a piggy bank for the crown. Um, And Otis, no one is more quotable on this on this particular subject than Otis. I should say, I should say about Otis that he um, can talk a blue streak. He's, he, John Adams at one point is very, is very good on the long afternoons in which Otis can spend an entire afternoon spending telling two stories. But that at a certain point, he is injured in a, in, a, in a brawl, in a public brawl with, in fact, one of the, um, one of the customs people sent to America to help collect revenue. And that after that, his health is, his mental health is greatly impaired. He'd always been um, a somewhat, he'd he'd always been a somewhat unpredictable character. But after that point, he is pretty much unclubbable. It's pretty much impossible to fold him into the political process because you don't know from one day to the next whether he'll be on the Tory side or whether he'll be on the Whig side. And Adam seems to have been somewhat instrumental in on the one hand, folding him into the process, but making sure that he didn't create too much damage. And it's clearly a heartbreak for Adams because the two of them had been tremendously close. And he does say he has, you know, tears in his eyes when he thinks about what has happened to his close associate. Uh, one last uh, sentence in this, because it still sounds like today. Uh, Adams, <laughs> Adams also began publishing the House proceedings, buttressing Bernard's charge that some seemed by every available means intent on carrying government, quote, nearer and nearer to the common people, unquote. What struck one side as suffrage appeared as insolence to the other. And if you factor in that when they did the uh, 
Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, the you know, the windows were buttoned down and there was no script of that until years later when Madison published uh, uh, or he he didn't publish it after he was gone. The, the words were published. Uh, how significant do you think that was to the future of openness? Oh, I think that was that was at the center of everything in which Adams believed. Um, this idea that government answered to the people should be responsive and should be responsible, and wasn't at the time. And that was anything he could do to make that process more transparent was something he believed in. And that's why the press plays such a role. I mean. No one, nothing so disturbs um, Francis Bernard, for example, the royal governor, any of the crown officers who come to, to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, more than the fact that this, this town has five newspapers. How could you govern a town with five newspapers, one customs officer asks. Um, the fact that the press is there and is active and that people are drawn into the process, um, town meetings, tremendously threatening to, um, to British authority. I want to jump to another story that you tell on page 167. Uh, it starts out by, in the print shop, the smell of ink heavy in the air. John Adams noticed something else about the purring political engine. Quote, the most talkative man alive, Otis, clogged its gears. He could devote an entire evening to bullying, bantering, reproaching, and ridiculing. And I'm not going to, I'm going to stop there and let you pick it, the story up from there when you also talk about a man named Robinson. Um. So Otis challenges Robinson. Um, Who was Robinson? Says, I'm sorry. Robinson is a customs, uh, is a customs official. Um, the customs officials are greatly hated um, by the, the radicals because obviously they represent everything, um, everything against which they have taken a stand. Here they, they're here to collect revenue, which no one believes should be collected in the first place. Um, and Otis is a little unbalanced at this point, and he essentially challenges Robinson um, to come and defend his honor, and he has challenges all of the, all of the customs officials. In fact, but it's with Robinson that he tangles, and the two of them meet. Um, the two of them, in fact, meet in a in a coffee shop, and we don't know what happens. Um, we have very differing accounts. It's a pretty brutal encounter, but a band of people seems to collect around the two of them, and and Otis gets really severely mauled in the course of this. He gets a huge gash in his forehead. He's bleeding all over. Um, and it is that injury that will unsettle his constitution going forward when he becomes deeply unpredictable. Um, and Robinson, in fact, will um, very quietly leave, leave um, America at that, very shortly thereafter. We need to fill in a blank, and that is when we were talking about Lexington and John Hancock being there and also Samuel Adams and Paul Revere coming to that area. What happened that night? Oh, what a blank to have, to have left unfilled. Revere comes to the house having pretty much worn homes along the way as he's galloping toward Lexington. Um, comes to the house and finds that the house at this point is encircled by a guard of eight or ten, it's unclear which, uh, men, which, had been, which been, had been established before he even left. They, won't, they don't recognize Paul Revere, unknown to them, although not unknown to us, and so they try to stop him, and he warns them that he actually has some pretty explosive news, so they let him through. He knocks on the door, and the Reverend Clark, in, in whose house everyone is staying, comes down and calls down and says, you know, who's there? And... Um, is very hesitant about admitting this late-night caller to his household. Um, at this point, evidently, John Hancock rolls up a window and realizes it's Paul Revere and says, you can let him in, it's our friend. Um, and Revere comes to the, tells the household that the British are marching out toward Lexington and assumes, um, for good reason, that, they are, that the point of their mission is to arrest if, or to assassinate Hancock and Adams um, for sedition. So... Revere essentially warns them of this much and then races along to continue um, sending, sending the word on the assumption that at this point Adams and Hancock have gone into hiding. In the next few hours, this is all over the course of a late night evening, late in the wee hours of the morning, um, Revere will, will, with his fellow riders, run into an ambush and be for several very taut hours in the company of some British officers who ask him where he's going, ask him where Adams and Hancock might be, 
um, take his horse from him, and he's left finally um, in, in, in the dark hours of the morning to walk by foot back to the parsonage, um, where he's very surprised to discover that Hancock and Adams have not budged, um, because Hancock is convinced that they should stay and fight. And finally, Revere prevails upon them to um, get out of there, because they're, they're clearly have been British officers barely down the road, um, and to seek cover, which they do. So they head off, um, and Revere will, in fact, go back very early in the morning to collect John Hancock's papers, at which time he will hear, as he puts it, but not see the first fire um, at the Battle of Lexington. So uh, the magazine arrived at my house uh, from uh, called Smithsonian, and there on the cover is the noble fury of Samuel Adams, a bold new view of the forgotten founder by Stacy Schiff. How did that happen? Um, it happened because my publisher um, got in touch with the lovely people at Smithsonian and said, would you like to run a piece of this book? And the very kind and generous people at the Smithsonian said, yes, we would be delighted to. Um, and then the question became, which part of the book? And that was their choice. So there are a couple of sort of set pieces in the book um, in the sense that, as with many lives, there are episodes of which are more familiar to us and which are less familiar to us. Obviously, the Boston Tea Party, I think, is a story that we think we know, but we've mythologized to a great extent. And I think Paul Revere's ride um, would fall in that category as well. Um, the Boston Massacre, I think we just don't even remember. I mean, I think so much of this is about stories that we grew up with, but we we've, we've go back to fair, only rarely, um, and that we have reduced to just a certain shorthand. And the Boston Massacre, I think, is one of those. We'll close it up here very soon, but I want to ask you about the basically the last chapter in your book. And you use Hilary Mantel's uh, in the, uh, the quote at the top of the chapter, um, History is what people are trying to hide from you, not what they're trying to show you. You search for it in the same way you sift through landfill for evidence of what people want to bury. Why did you pick that? Um, I think Adams's very absence tells us a great deal. And how he goes missing, the fact that he means to go missing the fact that he's much more comfortable behind the scenes, all of those things I think are central to, are, are, are terrifically important to the story. And as we know, history belongs to the eloquent. Whoever, who, the person who leaves the best papers wins. And in this case, to a large extent, it's John Adams. Thomas Jefferson obviously is the most eloquent writer. Um, but you're not, when you're, when you're looking through what, we, what, what survives, you are so often led astray by the fact that you have bushels of evidence on one side and maybe not so much evidence on the other, but that those don't necessarily correlate to what is most important. And I think Adams so much survives in um, some of those gaps in the record. Partly those are gaps he created, obviously. Um, those gaps are necessary because he's fomenting revolution in many ways. But it, it speaks so much to how he comported himself as well that it was he's slipping from the room at all times. He's done his work here. He doesn't he doesn't need to attract the spotlight. Um, you know, so much of what of what you do as a biographer sort of knit together the silences and, and here the silences it seemed to me were were were, were critical. What was the end of his life like? The third act of the life is is really dissatisfying. He. Um, he is very out of step with um, the country. He's very disapproving of federalism. He isn't really certain that he's... He's very much a Massachusetts man. Massachusetts is his country. He's very uncertain of how Massachusetts fits into the rest of the picture. Um, so it's with great hesitation um, that he casts a vote to ratify the Constitution. He seems to be as much at odds with everyone in the decades following the revolution, as he had been at ease with everyone before. He, he ends up trusting people he should never have trusted. He sometimes backs people who are pretty shady characters. Um, and he holds to this ideal, which was very much a pre-revolutionary ideal, um, 
a very very pure and a very religious and a very Spartan America, which is at a time when, with rising prosperity, the country begins to embrace um, a very different vision of itself. And he's, in that sense, completely left behind um, by the tide. I mean, he really represents this kind of Republican austerity at a time when everyone is invested in great prosperity. What are the chances that you might strike gold in a book like this ends up back on Broadway like Hamilton? I think precisely zero, but thank you for the thought. <laughs> <laughs> but you have so many characters in there. Wouldn't it fit? Wouldn't it work? You know, I, now that, since you've spent, since you've reminded me of Otis, I mean, he's really a fabulous character for the for the stage because you can, he's just endlessly colorful. What's your thinking about a next book? I think a next book would be a good idea. I think that's as far advanced as I am in my thinking. Maybe you have a suggestion, Brian. <laughs> Now, this is where you're an expert, not me. What, what, um, uh, what, what I think was... I'm still so, I think I'm still so much, you know, I, I often have this problem with the book where, and I haven't entirely divested my, I, I'm still very much invested in, in Samuel Adams. I, I haven't really left him. I don't really want to move the files out of my office quite yet. So I, I think, it, and, I, and I'm not sure I can really entertain a new thought until I've reached that part of the process. I, I've never really known after I fin- immediately after I finish a book, or even when I start talking about it, what is next on the agenda? Because I'm still so much, so much in it. And when was the last word written for this book? What what was the timing on it? The last word was written, I think, um, in December of last year. I think maybe January of this year. I finally, um, I finally wrote the last few pages, somewhere between December and January. And of all the books you've written, how did, where does this fit in as far as, uh, for you, uh, a pleasure? Um, they're all pleasures in retrospect, and they're all <laughs> deep, deep and, and brutal suffering in the course of writing them. I mean, every book has its own, as you know, every book has its own pleasures and every book has its own perils. Um, Sometimes the archive serves you well. I mean, the, the Franklin book is the perfect counterexample to this book. I had more information for Ben Franklin's years in Paris, more material for those years than uh, than for anything. I mean, there are two and a half years as many as much paper for the French years as for the rest of Franklin's life combined. I was swimming in paper, and yet there were certain essential questions I could never answer. Um, so, in in this case, where the record is very shoddy and at times just invisible. Um, you know, it, it's, it feels less of a burden that you can't answer questions because you, you know you're not going to be able to answer those questions. There just isn't something to go on. But you also come up, you know, occasionally the, the sensational pieces about the troops in Boston are case in point. You sometimes come up with just really, you know, fascinating material that has, for whatever reason, um, not, had it, not had it to do on the page. And in this case, you have a character, to me anyway, a, a character which is quintessentially American, um, and whom, to whom I think we all relate, especially today, um, who has these fundamental, who, who, who enunciates these fundamental ideas about democracy, who had gone missing. Uh, thank you for doing this. I have to tell you one quick little nugget. Uh, I grew up in a small town in Indiana, and in Indianapolis there was a Crispus Attucks High School. I never really wow. knew who he was. They were a basketball powerhouse where Oscar Robertson went. But um, thank you for educating me about Crispus Attucks, a black man who was killed. That's that's quite cutting edge that that, that, that it was named for him. That's marvelous. Yeah. The book is called The Revolutionary Sam. Samuel Adams, our guest, has been Stacey Schiff. And we thank you for putting up with our technical difficulties. Thank you so much, Brian. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for listening to the Book Notes Plus podcast. Please rate and review Book Notes Plus, and don't forget to follow so you never miss an episode. Questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org. 